Symbiote as Superhero, a look at Venom and Captain Marvel and a discussion of why we're all covered in bugs all the time with Dr. Mark Siddall, the American Museum of Natural History's King of Creepy Crawlies. Up next on Science Goes to the Movies. Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovetz. Today we're going to talk about Venom, plus a real science update to Jurassic Park and why we're never getting the woolly mammoth back with Dr. Mark Siddall, parasitologist, American Museum of Natural History curator, Division of Invertebrate Zoology principal investigator, SIGC genomics lab professor at the Richard Gilder Graduate School. My goodness, you've got some titles there, Mark. A couple of hats, yes. <laughs> Excellent. First, I've got some questions about Venom. In the 2018 Sony Marvel film starring Tom Hardy, based on the comic book character written by David Michelin and Todd McFarlane, reporter Eddie Brock and the alien Venom form a superhero through symbiosis. We have a deal. Eyes, lungs, pancreas, so many snacks, so little time. That power. It's not completely awful. You have no idea how much you're scaring me right now. Eddie, cooperate. And you just might survive. Guys, you do not want to do this, trust me. Giant leaps will always come at a cost. We're going to be hearing a lot about superhero symbiotes. Captain Marvel has an alien life hitching a ride in a human body, and the upcoming Shazam, who's also sometimes known as Captain Marvel, features a superhuman force jumping into an American tween. Mark, in real life, which symbiotic relationships result in superheroes? There, there aren't, well, there's lots of symbiotic relationships that, re, that relate to superpowers. The thing that's weird about Venom is that it's, it's a parasite conferring a superpower, which is really not something we see a lot of. Well, he starts out as a parasite. He starts out as a parasite and eventually becomes a, a symbiotic, mutualistic relationship. And, and, you know, even we parasitologists kind of debate a lot about where does parasitism end and mutualism start. And this is really kind of cool that this shows up in the movie. In terms of symbiosis, we see lots of things happening. There are bacteria that live in the guts of insects and in the, in, even in the guts of cows that allow them to eat plant matter, without which they wouldn't be able to eat and survive and reproduce and so forth. Things like uh, the corals in the Great Barrier Reef, they have symbiotic organisms that allow them to capture the power of the sun and be able to grow. And what about, we hear a lot about our own gut bacteria these days. Yeah, in fact, there are there's certainly more individual organisms and species inside of us than our single species alone. And in fact, there are lots of insects and other animals where the number of individual cells that are symbiotic organisms is exceeds the number of cells of the animal itself, of its own body. There are some really cool superpowers, in addition to what we see with like the coral reefs, being able to capture sunlight, that you see in interestingly, otherwise parasitic relationships. We see, for example, in a lot of insects that have a bacterium called Wolbachia, that it confers the power to be able to reproduce without any males. Now, many people would consider that a terrific superpower. <laughs> Not only that, but when the children are infected with the bacterium after they, after they hatch and they grow, the bacterium kills the males. And so you get all female lineages. You work in the world of creepy crawlies. Are most symbiotic relationships on the bug level or do they go higher up the food chain? They go right up the food chain. Uh, we see lots of them, of course, in the bugs. We have symbionts in, inside of ourse ourselves, not just our, our microbiome, but the mitochondria that live inside of each and every one of our cells and in the cells of all plants and all animals and all fungi actually originated like maybe a billion and a half years ago by a symbiotic relationship of a bacterium getting inside of another organism, allowing it to use oxygen instead of being killed by oxygen. 
But so are, are, are mitochondrial cells or the mitochondrial part of our cell, are they not, are they not us? They are us. They're very much us, but we are, a, in a sense, what we call a holobiont. There's distinct DNA inside of the mitochondrion that is distinct from the DNA inside of the nucleus of your cells that makes it do those things. And those have distinct histories that, uh, that go back in time a very, very long time. We wouldn't exist without them. We are, in fact, symbiotic organisms in terms of our origin. Not just our species, it's way, way back at the very early lineages of, of uh, what we call eukaryotic life. But we're all Eddie Brock in a certain way then. In a certain way. And it's funny, you know, in Star Wars, they referred to them as metachlorians instead of mitochondria. And this was the causative agent of the force. I thought the force was better when it wasn't explained so well. <laughs> in the movie Venom, Eddie Brock warms to his symbiote and ends up a pretty happy host to the alien Venom. Do symbiotes actively protect their relationships? This does happen in certain circumstances. There is a, a trematode parasite, a flatworm parasite of blue mussels, the edible mussel, that when it infects that muscle, the muscle actually grows a lot faster. We also see, for example, the, there are parasitic wasps that when they infect the, the caterpillar that they put their egg inside of, they're also injecting a virus. That virus prevents the caterpillar from transforming. So ultimately, it's, def it's detrimental. But in the short term, it causes that caterpillar to grow really, 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 really big. And then, interestingly enough, by virtue of being infected with that virus, other virus groups can't infect the, the caterpillar at all. And so it's protective of it. So the, the symbiote superhero is really quite a valid storyline. Sure. It is a valid storyline, and yet ultimately, I think in a lot of these situations, it is at the detriment of the ultimate host. Even Eddie can't survive now without the, the symbiote because, yeah. you know, he's got cancer or whatever is going on, and it's going to protect him from, from that. And he can't keep his girlfriend with the symbiote either. I mean, it, you can't really have a human life when you're two things. I mean, maybe, but, you know, you did see Stan Lee, the late Stan Lee at the end of that movie, saying, both of you, you should get her back. Don't give up on her, either of you. We won't. Who is that guy? Okay. Wait, this thing looks delicious. There's two Captain Marvel stories coming out, and it's very complicated with the DC Marvel. There's the DC Captain Marvel, who is Shazam, and the Marvel Captain Marvel, who is Captain Marvel. <laughs> right. Now, one is a symbiote, or are they both symbiotes? Well, in fact, neither is really a symbiote like we see in Venom, where it's two distinct organisms coming together. And so it's, there's actually three things going on there. And of course, there's the great complication of that Shazam was actually the wizard who gave the powers to Billy, and he's Car Captain Marvel when he invokes Shazam. And that's really like a magical power. There's no other organism that he's getting that's merging with his organism to make him powerful. In Venom, you have two distinct organisms coming together, becoming a holobiont, if you will, uh, like us and our mitochondria. In the Marvel Universe, there's Marvel, who is a Kree, and he's, he's an alien. Carol Danvers has an accident, an explosion, and she gets stitched back together, and she's now partially human and partially Kree DNA. And so that's something that's not the same as a symbiont, that's really kind of like a hybrid, in, in a sense. And, and that's something that we can do genetically right now. Ha. I know. Okay. Well, this goes right into our next conversation. The American Museum of Natural History hosts the Margaret Mead Film Festival, and this year there was a documentary called Genesis 2.0, which details events that unfold when Siberian tusk hunters discovered a nearly intact woolly mammoth carcass, and the real world attempts to recreate this ancient extinct species, essentially a real-life Jurassic Park, because that worked out so well for everyone. Mark, they're calling... <laughs> They're calling this de-evolution, and some people are calling it reckless hubris of biblical proportions, and I know that you have some very strong feelings about it. I have a lot of strong feelings about it, and I think as with, as with the Marvel and the DC Universe and Captain Marvel, there's some confusion going on here as to what's really happening behind the scenes in the science, and people are confusing things like cloning with gene editing, and we can very easily do gene editing with something like uh, uh, an extinct mammoth. We can get little bits of their DNA using CRISPR-Cas9 technology. We can insert those bits of DNA into cells of, say, an elephant and see if those will get expressed, and then you have a hybrid elephant-mammoth thing. But it's not an elephant, and it's not a mammoth. You'd have to 
have a clone of a mammoth in order to do that. And what the Genesis 2.0 story was really trying to do is seeing if they could find a cell, an intact cell with intact DNA, with an intact nucleus, with the complete DNA of a mammoth. And then you could take that, for example, and insert it into an ovum, an egg cell of maybe a, an elephant or something else, and see if that would grow. That would, in fact, be like what was done with Dolly, the, the sheep, the first cloned animal. That's not something that is even close to, to happening, and I don't think it's going to happen either because the DNA is all going to be degraded and weird. If they had found a living cell of mammoth tissue inside this carcass, would, it then have been, would they have then been able to Jurassic Park, the woolly mammoth, back into being? It's potentially, I, I still think there's a lot of impediments to it. Technically for cloning, you need the intact cells of, of the mammoth and usually you need an, an, an ovum that, that, that's going to work with. And so taking the DNA from the nucleus of a cell of one animal and then sticking it into the egg of a different animal, you have these things called cytoplasmic incompatibility where it doesn't really work. You can't really take a human bunch of DNA from a nucleus and stick it into an orangutan ovum and hope Nor it would Nor would work. you want to. The next question is, where's the adult woolly mammoth that you're going to implant the ovum into? Because that's what we do with cloning. You have to implant that, 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 that egg into something that it will grow in. So presumably you would put it into an elephant. And then when that, it, let's say that woolly mammoth thing actually gets born, is the mother elephant going to accept it and, uh, as its own? Because it's certainly not going to recognize it. Is it going to smell like a woolly mammoth or is it going to smell like an elephant? It may have hair like a woolly mammoth because we got those genes in there. It's, all, it's, it's very complicated and, it's, and it's, it's, right now it's sort of on the, on the fringes as to whether or not you can, which is distinct from whether or not you should. In the film Genesis 2.0, we see a little bit about George Church, the American geneticist, molecular engineer, and chemist who's also trying to reinstate the woolly mammoth through genetic engineering. If George Church succeeded in re-engineering the woolly mammoth, would we have a woolly mammoth or, or would we just have a, a hairy, big-headed, funky elephant? The way, it's, the way the research is going right now, you would have a hairy, big-headed, funky elephant. You wouldn't actually have a mammoth. You would have to have entirely only mammoth DNA. And we're not even sure that we know what that's going to look like because over the course of the last 10,000 years, the bits of mammoth DNA have been getting modified by the environment. There isn't a living organism keeping it intact. So that's sort of, George Church is kind of doing the Captain, the Captain Marvel Marvel universe version of... Yes, of a hybrid organism hybrid. To, to see if you can bring it back. Look, there's lots that can be learned by trying to do this sort of thing. Uh, we, one would hope that most of what we learn is on the positive side, not on the negative side. Are biological species immutable? Are, are, are any of us actually singular, or are we all defined, like Eddie Brock, by our symbiotic relationships? We are singular in the sense that we can identify each other as, as individuals and as distinct from other species. But, and we are, not a, we are not immutable in the sense that we evolve. But we are, we are not entities unto, entirely unto ourselves. And we, the, the, the scientific term that we use for this is really not about species, but about niche, the niche concept, and that we exist in relationship to other things. And so in a sense, if you're going to bring back a woolly mammoth, you won't have properly brought it back, even if you can get its genetics entirely correct, unless you bring back the holobiont all of the gut bacteria that it had and the viruses it had and the, the other things in its environment that it was affecting, even the things that go out in its poop and then the things that colonize its poop and then the stuff that grows on that. So you have, you, the idea that bringing back a species on its own is sufficient to really de-extinct I think is problematic. Interesting question then would be, suppose you create some hybrid elephant mammoth thing, uh, would that be a new species? Would we consider it a new species? If we released it into the wild, would it be, it would be immediately endangered, by the way, because there would only be about two or three of them. And then you would have to get them to mate. Uh, and hopefully but you wouldn't just How bring can... back a new species to watch it go extinct again. Right, right. That would be terrible. Yeah. And ethically challenged. Yeah. And wh wh what is the woolly mammoth going to, to do on the earth? Whoa. Well, beyond the P.T. Barnum side of things, it'd yeah. be really interesting. I would, you know, it'd be kind of cool to touch a woolly mammoth. Yeah, yeah. Even something that looked like a woolly mammoth. Uh, I, you, you know, the idea is that you can rewild various places. You can put mammoths back 
into the American West or into the Great Plains or up into, up into Alaska or wherever you think they were at a certain point in time. But the ecosystem that they were in did not, hasn't existed for over 10,000 years. Right. There are other species there now that have every right to exist and maybe have been pushed into those places because of our own encroachment into theirs. And if we throw a mammoth in there, are we going to drive other species extinct because of some sense of ecological guilt? Yeah. Let's move from venom to poison. And if you're a writer and you're thinking about poisoning one of your characters, you might want to grab your notebook because our guest, Dr. Mark Siddall, literally wrote the book on poisons and curated a killer exhibition at the American Museum of Natural History. And to help you avoid the movie trope trap, he is going to give us a quick screenwriter's guide to poison, starting with the clues. Okay, so Mark, uh, fictional detectives are always sniffing around and declaring sure. that they smell bitter almonds, so it must be cyanide. Uh, cyanide, you can, you can detect cyanide by smell, but it is actually quite volatile. So in fact, if it's been a certain length of time after someone's poisoned themselves or, or somebody else, you're not gonna smell it. And that's the actually interesting thing about cyanide. Cyanide occurs in an enormous number of plants, um, even occurs in, in wild cassava that was domesticated by humans in, in uh, South America. And it's great because it protects the plant while it's in the ground. Nothing will feed on it. Uh -huh. We learned how to, like, to beat it up and then uh -huh. rinse out the cyanide, and then it's because it's so volatile, it just goes away. So you can smell it because it's volatile, but because of that, that means it's not going to stick around very long. Most other poisons that I think are used in the movie tropes or the story tropes don't generally have a, a smell on their own. They're much more like iocane powder. It's odorless and tasteless and, and so on. But they generally also don't work as instantly or close to instantly as cyanide does. In movies, the antidote is always very specific and it removes the, the poison poof like magic. Mm -hmm. Is that what an antidote, antidote does and, and how does that work? It would be great if antidotes did, it all, did that all the time. Often what we're really trying to do with an antidote is just treat the symptoms. So if, if a particular drug or sorry if a particular toxin is introduced and it stops breathing then you want to reintroduce breathing or something like that uh, there are a couple of cases though where you do see an antidote that is very specific and probably the weirdest one is strychnine and curare and they're both in the same genus of plant they're both in strychnos so strychnine causes this clenching uh, sort of tightening of the muscles and it's interesting that it's it's probably the source of the, the Riddler's smile because it also causes your face to clench up like this into a painful smile. And the antidote, interestingly enough, is curare, which is from a different, a different species of strychnos that causes a relaxing of the muscles. And too much of that can actually cause you to stop breathing. So they're both toxic, but one is actually an antidote to the other. So this whole, I mean, there's a whole movie world of uh, a, a whole, so many stories are, I've poisoned your man uh, and you have to go do this task or I, until I give you the, the antidote that I created. Is that not scientifically valid at all? By and large, it's not scientifically valid. But there's a, there's this storytelling about antidotes goes way, way back in time. And you can tease them out into... Things that you can take that will prevent you from being poisoned, things that you can take if you've been poisoned, things that you can use to detect poison, and there's quite a lot of stuff in there that, that's, you know, even things like using silver chopsticks. Is that valid? Or no. It's just a myth. Is there no get out of poison free card that's just a, a blanket antidote for anything? No, but, but people have thought this in the past. They thought that if you took a little bit of poison every day, that you could build up resistance to it. This comes through in The Princess Bride as well with developing a resistance to iocane powder. Inhale this, but do not touch. I smell nothing. What you do not smell is called iocane powder. It is odorless, tasteless, dissolves instantly in liquid, and is among the more deadly poisons known to man. There's a very interesting part in your exhibition at the Museum of Natural History about poisons seeming magic. What's magical about poisons? They're, they're unseen agents. Poisons are unseen agents. You don't see them the same way you see so claws and teeth and body size and speed in the natural world as being something that animals and plants can do with spikes and things like that. So you don't really see it. It's happening in an invisible way. Huh. You don't really know that you've been poisoned until it starts manifesting itself. And so I think it seems magical that way. And it also, I think in most cases in our history, we felt very powerless mm. against it. Um, you can't really defend against poison if you don't see it coming. You can defend against a spear. You can defend against 
you know, all kinds of things. But, the other, but if poisons and venoms can kill us, if we don't see them coming, then they seem kind of mysterious and magical. Well, about that don't see them coming, we always show poisons as green. We always show poison. Well, we always show poisons as green. What is that? Is there any validity to that? And, and, and if there's not, what do you tell a screenwriter? How should they show their poisons? I, I, you know, it's funny you say that because I think it all should be blue. There's no blue food. Even blueberries are purple. There's really, and you know, raspberry has for some reason been turned into blue in ices and things like that for a reason I don't even understand because raspberries are red. But yeah, it should be blue. There's no blue food. Blue would be the thing that tells you that, oh, this is, this is poisonous. This is not food. This, this is, is not, not right. food. Right, 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 right. In The Princess Bride, the dread pirate Roberts defeated Wallace Shawn with the display of acquired immunity or mithridicism. Named for Mithrates, the sixth king of Pontus, who supposedly invented the practice to save himself from his own murdering mother and then used it against invading Romans. Is acquired immunity possible? In very limited circumstances, and they're not very good ones. Interestingly, Mithridates died, I think, in early death, and so did Emperor Chin, who took a little bit of mercury every day, thinking it would prolong his life. It actually caused a, a very early death. The, the idea, I think, must come from the most common form of poisoning, which is alcohol poisoning. Ah. And we do know, for example, from personal experience, that if you, if you drink alcohol regularly, it takes much more alcohol to actually cause you to be intoxicated. Similarly, for people who are heroin addicts, they have to take much more heroin as time goes on in order to get the same effect that they're looking for as opposed to someone who, you know, takes an opiate for the first time. These aren't necessarily good things no. because it <laughs> means that you're seriously taxing your, your nervous system and your liver and so forth, and it will eventually kill you. So uh, Wallace Shawn and Mithrates would have eventually died of this poisoning, just they would have had a couple of opportunities to mess to mess around. Certainly we can develop immunity to certain kinds of toxins like snake venoms. And that comes from repeated exposure just like with any kind of protein. But there is no safe amount of mercury. There is no safe amount of lead. There is no safe amount of arsenic. In your exhibit at the American Museum of Natural History, you had a, a section devoted to the Mad Hatter from Alice in Wonderland. Is he a good example of poisons that build up in your system? Weirdly enough, yes, even though poisons are really not talked about in Alice in Wonderland. But Lewis Carroll lived in Stockport in the UK, which was the hat-making capital of the United Kingdom, and they used mercuric nitrate in order to soften the beaver pelts. And so the idea that hatters, people who were making hats, would have weird behavioral problems and, and would become shy and, and quick to anger and so forth was actually because of the, mer the slow and steady mercury poisoning that was happening. Weirdly enough, if you look at the most recent movie done by Tim Burton, the hatter actually has orange hair, which is a reference to the fact that using mercuric nitrate on the beaver pelts would turn the beaver pelts orange. It was called carroting. So they would put a poison on clothing with the idea that, never mind, of course the hatters would fall ill. Would everybody else who came in contact with this poison also fall ill? It was really the fumes, we think, oh. that were from the, the hot mercuric nitrate that they were sinking all of the pelts into. And of course, they were getting it soaking in through their, their skin and so forth. So wearing a hat probably didn't expose you to too much. Right. Are we doing these things to ourselves now? Oh, we're doing things to ourselves constantly that we probably shouldn't be. The world's a safer place than it used to be, though, because we have things like the Food and Drug Administration and the, the EPA and other governmental organizations that, whose mandate it is to, to keep us safe, so long as we properly fund them and properly empower them. Are there historic poisonings that still remain unsolved? Sure, uh, Napoleon. Uh, Napoleon had lots of arsenic in his tissues and he died of some weird sort of metabolic syndromes that could have been arsenic poisoning and people have thought that maybe the British were poisoning him. But the truth of the matter is there was also a lot of arsenic in the wallpaper in the room that he was in because the green colors were made from arsenical compounds and in, in the, this damask patterning that was very common at the time. We don't really know for sure whether or not anybody intentionally tried to, to poison him. Similarly, we can go back to things like Cleopatra. Uh, the idea that Cleopatra died from an asp bite well, it certainly wouldn't have been an asp because you can't really die from an asp bite. You can 
it'll hurt and you could get sick, but you won't die. And she knew her snakes. I mean, she was using, she was experimenting with prisoners and snakes and snake bites, so she wouldn't have used an asp. She might have used an Egyptian cobra, but the death wouldn't have been instant because it takes a long time to die even from a cobra bite. Maybe somebody just suffocated her to death and then said that, that she got bit by an asp. Uh, Who knows? Uh. For a screenwriter, then, really, it, it seems sort of, if you really want to have a good mystery, it's the residual things that poison leave behind is a more uh, more scientifically viable idea than this whole antidote thing. Yeah, in a sense, in terms of the trying to discover what has happened if somebody has died of poisoning, we often look for things like the metabolites of the poisons, which is just the same sort of thing that they look for in anti-doping in uh, the Olympics. You're not necessarily looking for the doping agent, you're looking for the metabolite left over after the doping agent has been processed by the body. Uh, so what our body has done based on the poison is a clue, mm -hmm. more than smell. Much more than smell. It would be uh, tissue tests, liver tests, serum tests, that sort of thing. So you got to go with bones more than Sherlock Holmes. No, that's good. I like that. Yeah. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for clearing up poisons and symbiotes. And I am so ready to watch Marvel and Captain Marvel and Shazam with such a better understanding of what I'm seeing. Thank you very much for having me here. I hope they bring back Poison Ivy, too. <laughs> yeah, right. She was great.